My title of my message tonight is The People, and I shortened it to get it on the, on, the, on the slide, but The People, the Land, and the Future of Israel and Jewish Evangelism Today. And uh, just, I wanted to make just a couple of statements. Uh, first of all, I believe that Jewish people need to consciously accept Jesus as their Messiah in order to have a place in the world to come. I think that most of you would agree with that, but I think it needs to be said. The saving faith grows out of a spirit-enlightened understanding of the gospel. I do not believe, therefore, that God's promises of establishing a future kingdom where the Messiah Jesus rules on the throne of David and the ensuing season of messianic shalom that fills the earth assures an individual Jewish person of a place in the age to come. Oftentimes when I speak about a glorious future for Israel and for the Jewish people, some people misunderstand that and think that you can have that future without the king. You can't. Yeshua is the key to everything. And in fact, not only is this motivating to me uh, that you must uh, uh, believe uh, in Yeshua in order to personally uh, have a place in the world to come. But it really motivates me. It really fuels my passion to reach Jewish people with the good news, knowing that there is actually a relationship between the Jewish people coming to faith and the second coming of the Messiah. And linking this end time salvation of the Jewish remnant with the second coming of Jesus creates a very powerful motivation for Jewish evangelism. And so the purpose of my little talk tonight in the chapter in the book is to help us understand the power of this end times or eschatological, that fancy word that we've all been using, for the Jewish evangelism as when believers in Jesus accept the idea that there is a link between the end time salvation of Jewish people with the second coming of Yeshua, then your average Christian becomes more passionate about Jewish evangelism. Conversely, when there seems to be nothing special about the Jewish people, when you do not understand that there is a link between the end time remnant coming to faith and Jewish people coming to faith and Jesus coming back, then the importance of Jewish evangelism is unfortunately diminished, and we actually see that this is a trend today. Fewer and fewer born-again Christians believe that there is a link between the salvation of Israel and the second coming of Jesus because they believe there's nothing unique about the Jewish people. Historically, Christians have accepted this link of every view. It's not just premillennialists, it's amillennialists, postmillennialists, and panmillennialists. It'll all pan out in the end. You know that one. <laughs> Traditionally, historically, Christians have accepted this link, yet today this perspective is diminished. And it's diminished for a number of different reasons, and that's one of the reasons for the conference, is to provide material, good, biblical, well-reasoned, theological material, so that evangelicals, born-again believers, or any kind of person who accepts Jesus as their Messiah and believes in bringing the gospel to the Jewish people will have a good basis for presenting this. Many Western Christians today have sided politically with those who believe that Israel doesn't have a theological right to exist. And that leads to viewing Israel negatively. As one Christian told me, the best way for Jewish people and Palestinians to get along is for the Jews to give the land back because they stole it. That's problematic, and it creates an image of Jewish people that is very negative, and let's be honest, who wants to reach 
people who we don't like with the gospel. Come on, you know that. Well, sometimes if we don't like them a lot, it motivates us a lot. But we don't, we need to love people, and when we are actually convinced that people are very unlovable, it makes them hard to reach, doesn't it? Jewish evangelism, like so many concerns of our day, are also driven by numbers. And therefore, since there are fewer Jewish people than Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and certainly Chinese. I was just in China. Many, many Chinese people in the world. You can't miss it if you go to China. Dynamic Christian movement in China, too. But Jewish evangelism has taken a, a back seat to those who are more numerous and to those who are more needy. I mean, how do I get you to move out there and reach all the Jewish people that live within, in the condos a mile and a half within the radius of this church? Where's the need? It's not obvious, isn't it? But the need is there. There is a shift in the UK, northern and central Europe, and it's rising in America that's fueled by the growing acceptance of the viewpoints of our new supersessionist and replacement theology brothers and sisters. And I want to stop there. They are my brothers and sisters. And if you hold that position, I love you because you love the same Lord as I love. And I really do not like the way some Christians have come out punching and antagonistic towards those who take a different view even on the future of Israel than I do or that many of you do. That's not the way to win friends and influence people. Listen, truth is, whether they believe it or not, it's going to happen. You're going to be with them forever. You may as well get along now. The American church is drifting from its premillennialism, and, and, and really many, especially of our younger people, are driven by compassion. And many are accepting a Palestinian narrative of history and agenda. But I have to stop there again. I don't want to be the person that says we shouldn't care about people who are suffering. You're not going to get really upset with people because they care about people suffering, are you? That's a godly thing to do. Like Michael said, that's showing love. And so I'm not upset with people who have become so empathetic and so compassionate, and they just don't understand a lot of the facts and so on, and they've been moved by their heart of compassion to accept the agenda and the narrative of people who are suffering. Look, better they make that mistake than become cold-hearted. But my goal is not only to try and put out some of the facts, I want people to love intelligently, and my hope is that believers will balance their theology with hearts of compassion and a desire for social justice, but that they will not throw out the theological baby with the compassionate bathwater. And so my goal is to help people understand God's continuing faithfulness to his covenants and promises with the Jewish people and then to also encourage a love for Jewish people, Palestinians, Muslims, Hindus, the entire world. Last time I checked, for God so loved the world. But when we accept this theological motivation, when we accept this eschatological understanding of the link between Jewish people coming to know Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, that provides a motivation for evangelism that transcends human need. It transcends everything because all of us have on our breath and on our lips 
Maranatha, even come, Lord Jesus. And so there are a number of critical passages in the Bible that I'd like you to look at with me. And the first one is one that you're probably pretty familiar with, and that's Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. There's that everyone. And then Paul says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In order to properly understand Romans 1.16, I think you need to see Romans 1.16 eschatologically. You need to see it as the link between the end-time repentance of Jewish people and the second coming of Jesus, and I'll explain it. I would suggest that that's the way Paul saw it. Now, Paul's not suggesting that the Roman believers withhold the gospel from Gentiles until every Jewish person in the world is reached. I don't think that's really a great understanding of Romans 1.16. Uh, practically speaking, in, in Brooklyn, that would take a long time. The Italians would never hear. <laughs> Romans 1.16 is written in the present tense. Therefore, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It is for everyone, for everyone who believes, and it is for the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we have to deal with this. What in the world is Paul talking about? In Matthew 6.33, he uses that, uh, Jesus uses the Greek word proton, which can either mean first in sequence or it could be first in priority, and I accept it as first in priority. So it's not first this, then that, it's first this, and that is a priority, and we do everything else, but we always keep that first thing in mind. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. It doesn't mean that um, you say to your wife, I can't take out the garbage because I'm seeking the kingdom of God, you know? I, I've tried it. <laughs> doesn't work. And so we seek this, the kingdom of God while we continue seeking all sorts of other things, and we can believe that the gospel should go to the Jewish people first as a priority while we continue to reach all the peoples of the world. In a similar way, reaching Jewish people with the gospel must be a priority concern. We also learned from uh, WW, uh, PD or DP, what would Paul do? Yeah, what would Paul do? And uh, whenever Paul went out in one of his uh, missionary journeys, he always went to the Jew first, didn't he? In Acts 13, Acts 14, Acts 18, Acts 19. Why did he go to the Jew first? Because he's the one who wrote Romans 1.16. <laughs> and Romans 1.16 is based on Romans 11. And we've heard about this over and over again. We'll keep hearing it that one day all Israel will be saved. And however you interpret the all Israel, it's more than there are now. And essentially what Paul is saying is Jewish evangelism must be a priority because something is happening in the future and we need to be part of it. The argument is this, if Jewish people are successfully evangelized, then Jesus the Messiah will return. Let me put it another way. When the Jewish people turn to Jesus, then Jesus returns to his people and the rest of us. And we look forward to that day. So based upon this, the church cannot think of Jewish evangelism as simply evangelizing another people group. The Jewish people have been tagged by God with a theological import unlike other people. Sometimes I'm like Tevya. Next time, choose somebody else. We cannot allow Jewish evangelism to become the great omission of the great commission because of Romans 1.16 to, to the Jew first in light of what God is doing in human history. Now, some of this is based on uh, Genesis chapter 12, and we've heard a lot about Genesis chapter 12. 
in verses 1 through 3, where God said, I'll bless those who bless thee, curse those who curse thee, and through you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There is no question that the Jewish people were chosen for the sake of the Gentiles. Jewish people were not chosen for survival, as a lot of modern Jewish theologians would say. Jewish people were not chosen to establish a beautiful committee, a community as sort of a passive witness to the rest of the world. Jewish people were actually chosen to be God's instruments of blessing to the world. The problem is, is Jewish people need to experience that blessing before they can do the blessing. And that's part of Paul's argument in Romans 11. In other words, if you think the failure of the Jewish people in rejecting Yeshua brought great blessings to the Gentiles, wait till you see what happens when the Jewish people turn to Yeshua. But I'd like to share with you just a couple of passages, three or four, that make the argument that I'd like to make. First of all, let's look at Matthew 23, which we have looked at already, and you will start hearing a lot of the same passages, and that shows that the Bible is consistent. So, Matthew chapter 23 is pivotal. Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and yet you were unwilling. Behold your house, which of course is a ref reference to the temple. That's the common first century terminology, habayit, uh, for the temple, the house. Your house is being left to you desolate. The destruction of the temple in 70 AD was the only actual judgment upon that generation of Jewish people for rejecting Jesus. That was it. In part. Uh, and then he says, from now on you will not see me until you say, so that's actually the second judgment, but that wasn't just on that generation, that one continues. <laughs> you know, sometimes God's most profound judgment is withdrawing his presence. And that's a judgment that not only happened to, to them, but happens, happens to us as a, because he's not here reigning on his throne. So, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A number of people have mentioned it, but for me, one of the most beautiful words in the Bible and the entire New Testament is the little Greek word, until. Because it gives me hope. Because even though there is judgment, the temple will be destroyed, Yeshua will not establish his kingdom, he will leave, he reminds us of God's Abrahamic blessings to the Jewish people and says, you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, which means one day, the Jewish people will say it. And so, again, this establishes this link between the end-time repentance of the Jewish people and the second coming of Jesus. When the Jewish people turn to Jesus, Jesus returns to his people. The hope is really spelled out in another passage we've looked at today, in Acts 3.19. Peter, uh, I, I love... Peter's uh, preaching style, and uh, I identify. I could use Peter in Brooklyn, you know. He would, I just think he would have a good ministry, you know. And uh, he likes Jewish people too. And, but, but Peter wasn't afraid. So after he, the, he, the lame man was healed in the temple, Peter felt it was a perfect opportunity for street preaching. And he really preached as an Old Testament prophet. He really had a very Old Testament prophet kind of uh, message. He says... At the end of going through a long litany of messianic prophecy, focusing on Isaiah 53, he comes to his early, uh, a very early version of a Billy Graham invitation. And he says, therefore, repent, change your mind, and return, shuva from the Hebrew. Repent and turn around. Oh, man, could have been Isaiah. Repent and return. 
so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing, as wonderfully described by our Luke Acts expert, Dr. Daryl Bach, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Basically, I just want you to take that literally. Take it literally. I mean, Peter and Paul and all of the apostles and all of these early evangelists had no concept that they were going to wait for a couple thousand years for the second coming. Every one of them thought that Yeshua was returning in their generation. And they preached with that type of urgency. Repent. When? Next week, next year. Wait for the revival. One day in the future. Repent now. He left. But listen, he said he's coming back. Remember until. So repent now. There was an urgency in their preaching. It wasn't just an urgency for people to get saved. It was an urgency for people to return to the Lord so that Jesus would return. Big difference. Do we really preach like that? Or are we uh, maybe too many dispensational charts? There's an urgency to our preaching, because we believe that when the Jewish people in particular come to know Jesus, Jesus returns. And I'm trusting that most of you want to see that happen. The next passage is uh, Zechariah 12.10. And we've mentioned this one. And in a sense, this is the fulfillment of these passages. In that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Uh, you think there's any possibility that Israel will be reestablished as a nation and surrounded by hostile neighbors? Give it some thought. <laughs> so in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, the Abrahamic covenant. I'll bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. You make an enemy out of Israel, you make an enemy of God. I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and then it's going to happen. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they will look unto me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Sound familiar? Well, what's happening here? What's happening here? is that the prophet whose, whose name means God remembers is telling us about God remembering. God remembers his covenant when Israel, future to today, when the Jewish people are in their most terrible and dire moment. They're about to be destroyed. And they don't even have the spiritual strength to cry out to God themselves. They're so hopeless and so God remembers the Abrahamic covenant. He pours out his spirit upon the Jewish people, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, Zechariah chapter 4. He doesn't send down heavenly IDF soldiers and missiles. He sends his spirit, who is always the answer to human weakness. And the spirit comes upon the Jewish people and turns their hearts around. And they look unto him whom they have pierced. So first God pours out his spirit. God takes the initiative. The Jewish people then turn and they look unto him whom they have pierced. And who is the one who was pierced? Ah, in this passage, actually, it's God. Listen, I was brung up in New York City. And I really learned the English. And so, grammatically though, I picked a few things up. And uh, it's the first person, isn't it? I will pour out on the house of David that's, and so on. And they will look upon me, first person, right? And they will mourn for him, which is third person. So the I and the me is God. And then the third person is who? <laughs> yeah, it's confusing, isn't it? Yeah. I, me, and him. 
Two first persons, one third person, all the same person. Yeah, it's not easy. But there's no doubt in my mind that at that moment, and you thought the Trinity wasn't in the Old Testament, huh? At that moment, the Jewish people recognize the one that they have pierced. Now, there's a number of things that happen chronologically here. And I just want to run through it quickly. Just going back to the passage. So the Jewish people are surrounded by their enemies, Zechariah 12, 3, verse 9. The Lord then determines to destroy the enemies of the Jewish people. God then pours out his spirit on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Those who receive his spirit, the Jewish remnant, turn to the one whom they have pierced, the divine Messiah. The Jewish people begin mourning as a nation, person by person, family by family, tribe by tribe, chapter 12, verse 11 and following. And then in chapter 13, a fountain is opened. Oops. A fountain is opened. Oh, well. A fountain is opened in chapter 13. The hymn writer had it right. A fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. The Lord battles against the enemies of the Jewish people. The Lord returns and stands on the Mount of Olives, which is split in half, and then continues to battle the enemies of Israel. He then establishes his messianic kingdom over all the earth with his capital in Jerusalem. And the Lord calls upon those nations that have survived his judgment to pay homage to him as king, as their king, by coming up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This passage makes it abundantly clear that the end time repentance of the Jewish people and their subsequent forgiveness of sin through the shed blood of the Messiah using the imagery of the fountain leads to the establishment of a literal messianic kingdom with Jerusalem as the capital. Now, evidently, these events have not yet taken place, or Michael would not have needed a plane to get here. It was not fulfilled even in John chapter 19, verse 37, where John quotes Zechariah 12 as a part of the fulfillment of the, uh, regarding the crucifixion. Dr. Charles Feinberg, in his commentary on Zechariah, summarizes these events for a moment. The events, world-embracing in character, which are presented include the world confederacy against Jerusalem, the conviction of Israel nationally by the Spirit of God, the presentation of Jesus as their rejected Messiah, the national day of atonement, the cleansing of hearts of the nation, the purging of of the land from idolatry, the crucifixion of the Messiah, the time of Jacob's trouble, the partial success of the nations invading Palestine or Israel and besieging Jerusalem, the appearance of the Messiah for his people, their rescue and his, rest, and his coming with his saints, the change in renovated holy, holy land, and the Feast of Tabernacles and more. Feinberg put it all in one sentence. But once again, we see this incredible truth that the return of the Jewish people to Jesus brings about the return of Jesus to his people and further to his land and the establishment of his kingdom. Perhaps it's summarized in Romans chapter 11, verses 12 and verse 15. Paul writes, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will the fulfillment be? In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. And what will their acceptance be? But life from the dead, not a personal resurrection, but a national resurrection of the Jewish people who were promised a great, great victory. Finally, I believe that Jewish evangelism, because of all of this, is a prophetic calling. You want to be a prophet? Preach the gospel to the Jewish people. Paul writes, 
I, for I don't want you to be informed of this mystery that you will be wise in your own estimation. A partial heartening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. You believe it? How's it going to happen? Here it is. I say then they didn't stumble so as to fall, did they? But may it never be. But by their transgression, the national rejection of Yeshua, which is reversed by the end time remnant in Zechariah chapter 12, salvation has come to the Gentiles. There's a purpose clause in the Greek, and that is to make them jealous or in order to make them jealous. And so God in his incredible wisdom has taken this precious gospel. He brought it to the Jewish people first. The Jewish people didn't embrace it. And so the Lord in his mercy used Jewish disciples to bring that same gospel to Gentiles. And the Gentiles embraced the good news with great excitement. But now in these last days, he has called the Gentiles to give it back. <laughs> to bring the gospel to those who brought it to them. To make Jewish people jealous. To be God's instruments in fulfilling the great blessings and promises of the Abrahamic covenant. So that the people, the land, will be united in a glorious future when the Messiah returns and establishes his kingdom. May our prayer always be that of Paul. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, for the Jewish people, is for their salvation. And my prayer, particularly for Gentile believers, for those in the church, is to be used of God powerfully in reaching the end time remnant for Jesus. And that begins with your Jewish friend and neighbor. God bless you.